Okay, so the initial questions today on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, who is Mitch Ewan? Well, he's right there. Here I am. Yeah, there he I'm is. I'm the hydrogen the systems yeah, program the manager. I'm the co-host with you, yeah, Jay. Yeah, H-N-E-I. A fellow very, very sailor. Very important person. And, and uh, the, the story of Mitch is going to be on the final exam, so write it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and David I, and he's the chief innovation officer of the University of Hawaii. Whoop. Wow. <laughs> Sitting right here among us. Thank you for coming down, David. Well, yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, he's going to be on the final exam, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our subject today, I'm going to let Mitch, you know, unfold it. Okay, ready, go. We're going to talk about UH innovation, uh, the opportunities, uh, the challenges, and the solutions. So how we can get UH uh, developed technology out into the marketplace and so that UH can be relevant uh, to the Hawaii economy. And uh, so I want to... Um, Talk with, uh, have, uh, talk with David, have a conversation about his challenges on how we can kind of evolve from uh, strictly academic to more entrepreneurial so that we can be supportive of the uh, Hawaii economy. So, um, so right off the bat, um, David, I'd like you to give us just a top level overview of the innovation program and, uh, and, what you're, and, and how you're you know, coordinating all the various um, universities, uh, uh, community colleges we have here in Hawaii. So, right, right. Oh, community um, colleges too, so we're talking yeah. about the whole system. We're talking about system. all the 10 campuses within the UH system. It is a challenge, of course, uh, because we're looking at very different entities from the very large flagship campus at uh, Manoa mm -hmm. to the much smaller campuses on neighboring islands, um, mainly serving the community needs. Right. So um, indeed, it is a great challenge, uh, which is part of the fun. Um, I, I really have two different, uh, very different job functions. One is the traditional technology transfer office. We actually just call it um, OTT, Office of Technology Transfer, uh, which takes university inventions to try to commercialize them and try to find outside collaborators or licensees typically, mm -hmm. or startup companies that could take such technologies and build, in, build them into products and services. And we then will get some income. Um, and that is uh, one side of the operation. The, the share? Oh, uh, yeah. What's yeah. the share? Uh, it, it's a rather- To tell the people. Yeah, it's a rather complicated uh, uh, system because we, we have different bargaining units and all that. But largely speaking, you can think of it more like a one third of the income will go towards the original Research. inventors, and one third to the university, one third to the department um, uh -huh. or academic unit. Okay. Um, but so that part is a technology transfer, uh, dealing primarily with technologies. Now, then we, I have this other hat that, that is chief innovation officer or the UH system. Mm -hmm. Now that's very different um, because uh, there we're trying to nourish the uh, ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship. And you, you're really working with people. You're working with a lot of students as well as faculty members, and one have you researchers. Right. Um, and you're hoping to either transform them or at least nudge them towards uh, a more innovative and more entrepreneurial status. Um, and thereby, the end result should actually eventually connect. So either we take our technologies or we take our people. And these two, they don't have to be come together, meaning our people using our technology. It could be our people using other people's technology or our technology being used by other folks, uh, not produced by UH. Uh, alumni or UH students, um, but could be outsiders, uh, outside industry. But coming down to it, we'll still have to answer the question that Mitch was asking. How can modern days, especially a state university, be relevant? Be relevant to the community, be relevant to the supporters, be relevant to the, to the shareholders, meaning the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. so I'll go back to that, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's been a question raised for a long time. I mean, when the university, for example, was funded by the legislature for less than a billion dollars, maybe it wasn't so pressing. But then when it crossed that line and, you know, went to a billion, one, billion, two, billion, three, 
people started to ask, you know, we're giving a lot of money away, what's the payback? And um, <coughs> Tom Apple, mm. Tom Apple, the previous, what, chancellor was it? Right. Yeah. Of Manoa, his, his big thing was to say, well, the university should provide for the community, should help. Mm -hmm. It should go out there and solve community problems. It should be involved. Roll up your sleeves and help the community. Uh, your point about relevance. But, you know, I would, I would add to that this, um, that if, you, if you're going to give away 1.4, whatever it is now, okay, then, then the university should have activities, such as the big universities on the mainland, Stanford comes to mind, mm -hmm. uh, where they make huge amounts of money off their inventions mm -hmm. or their faculty's inventions, and it helps defray the, the, the government cost of running the university. And, and that softens the blow for the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that hasn't really happened. I mean, one, one more point, and I'll stop, is that when Marcy Greenwood was the president, she created this dichotomy, you recall. She said, we have tremendous grants coming in, and those grants are themselves an industry. So we want to increase the grants. We want to go for the most grants we can possibly get, and that brings money into the state because it pays the salaries and the expenses of the researchers. But that really, you know, I never felt very comfortable about that. Because the other side of it is much more highly leveraged. You know, you hit a discovery. We talk about Aaron Oda in, in engineering. Um, if he hits a discovery to, to make a liver using <laughs> tiny bubbles and, and uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, microfluidity, mm -hmm. micro, microfluidics, uh, then, you know, that's going to be really big. And, that's gonna, and, that's gonna, and you know, take that formula, and that's going to inure to a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And just put note to that is I was thinking of Ryozu Nak Nakamatsu. Uh, I forget what department he was in, but he's the one who invented green sheep and did all this genetic mm -hmm. changing back what almost 20 years ago he did right. this. Right. He invented, are you ready? Are you guys yep. sitting down? He invented in vitro fertilization. I mean, as it is known in the world today, right. here in Manoa, a few feet from where offices are, he invented it. And you know what the university made on that deal? Nothing. The state of Hawaii, nothing. Because he didn't get a patent. And by the time anybody in his department thought about getting a patent, it was way too late. And he wound up getting in litigation over it. They never made any money. So, you know, it's a matter of finding a way to take that kind of uh, either Aaron Oda or Ryosu Nakamatsu uh, and putting those deals together so we can actually earn uku bucks from everywhere. And what a job. How do you sleep at night? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, because of the fact that uh, I, I also I'm from the industry uh, more than 20 years in uh, Silicon Valley and then, uh, then at other institutions, including uh, Stanford, six years and four years in Hong Kong. Um, so I've seen the full spectrum of uh, different institutions. And it is safe to say that there's, there's always room to improve in terms of the commercialization of any university, Stanford included. Um, however, we also need to set a reasonable expectation. So this is a very interesting game. Um, it's sort of like, not really like hunting. It's really like agriculture, like a farmer's job. But it's even worse because you plant a lot of seeds and the seeds are planted by, well, through the, the government's sponsorship support, uh, you have the money to pursue research, but you're really at the mercy of researchers. So they plant a lot of seeds in this field. You have no idea what's going to grow out of this field. Right. And well, it takes many, many years. Researchers are a special <coughs> group. Yeah, they, uh, are. they are. I will never forget the story of the new Fitzsimmons, which is near mm. uh, Denver. It's a hospital just like uh, Tripler. In fact, it's also pink. And uh, the, I guess it was the state, or maybe it was, it was the federal uh, economic agency um, recreated this as a big pharma research place. And um, the, the, the problem, uh, Robert Olson was the guy who was in charge. Uh, the problem was to try to get researchers to come there yeah. because it's hard to get them to come there. You know, they're not like ordinary people. <laughs> Were you a researcher, Dave? No. Okay, he, he didn't want to tell <laughs> I never was. Re researchers are different. And um, so how do you get them there? And Robert Olson invented this technique. It was called breakfast. <laughs> what he did is he, he made a breakfast for them several times a week. 
and they could come to the breakfast and share under yeah. cover of what do you call it privacy nobody nobody would repeat what they heard okay. nobody would right. violate you know any secrecy that way and and all the research would talk to each other and yeah. it would stimulate their research thinking right yeah. but they're not entrepreneurs i'm sorry no. to say they need entrepreneurs to help them right. <laughs> that's the problem so these guys working on these highly technical things and doing remarkable global kind of in, yeah. in, inventions they're not the, the same people that will carry it to to commercialization yeah it's it's, it's uh, really uh, you know what you can do is to try to prepare the field uh, to the best way you can and then you, you water it with a lot of resources and then you just pray because <laughs> it, it really depends for example a, um, a survey was conducted back in the early 2010s I can't remember the exact year, 2013, something like that. Among all the um, uh, universities that returned the survey, so that's a self-selected sample, um, only about 14% of the universities actually reported that they, they were able to break even in terms of their investment in this kind mm -hmm. of a technology transfer office. Right. So the vast majority of them, 86% of them, were losing money. So it's a very small fraction. And remember, these are from the ones who return the survey. Right. So right. usually it's there are a lot, more, yeah. a lot more than who, who just right. were too embarrassed. <laughs> they, they didn't want to share their data. Yeah. So, um, but, and even at Stanford, for the first about 10 years, it, it wasn't profitable. Uh, so it took many, many years. And so how do you do it? I remember at OTED, we yeah. pay, and at the time, I don't know what it costs today, but to get a patent was about, I mean, a utility patent. Yeah. Uh, not the temporary, but the final mm -hmm. would cost, on the average, $30,000. Right. Maybe it's more That's now. Probably. Yeah, yeah. there's still, the, the, you know, nowadays, uh, the, the, the legal services, they, they learn to live with uh, realistic budgets. So, okay. <laughs> so we're, we're still about that level, okay. 25000 It's a bit, and so the investigation thing, it's the prior art question, yeah. you have to go look. But, but yeah. my, my point, though, is that OTED would, would actually pay for that. Yeah. So, and, and the researchers would come in, and they were en genoux. They had no idea how to do this. But OTED would actually arrange it and pay the right. bill. Right. That was very incentive, big incentive. Right. Are you doing that now? Can you do that we're, now? We're still doing that now. And uh, also, we're trying to uh, economize our own operation by filing in for selected cases, we might actually choose to file a provisional application, which is the inexpensive one uh, that will last only one year. We might actually file them ourselves from the office. I, I am a, a licensed patent lawyer in California, uh, also hired And you look like an ordinary one. person, David. Thank you for saying <laughs> that. <laughs> look at you. <laughs> um, and uh, we also have another uh, patent lawyer on the staff. So we're able to do that. Uh, but then we're also trying to use our marketing activities to try to be more selective in terms of uh, which provisional patent applications within the year we'd like to convert to the utility mm -hmm. patent application uh, because that's where you need to spend much more money. And you have to do that within the year. You have to do that You're within the year. So you to try to actually uh, put in the provisional patent application early, and then you quickly do the marketing, allow the market to provide enough feedback in terms of, well, is there a real market right. need or a market interest in this? And use that to guide your uh, decision whether or not to convert into a utility yeah. application. So the other part of it, though, is if you, if you give a quick claim, like you say, okay, we're not really interested in this, it's not going to work, you have to give that the uh, inventor enough time to be able opportunity to, to can, take over to take over because mm -hmm. when the year is up it's up yeah. and, you can't uh, tell him the last day no right. you can't tell him the last right. day and right. uh so he's got to get his act together so uh, exactly. i want to ask you about the incentives like right can, now can you hold on oh, that i can take hold a on short that. break oh okay Absolutely. okay and uh by, by this time you would be getting pretty interested you may realize that this is the future in many ways yeah, economically of the university and the state when we come back, we're going we're to hear about the incentives from Mitch yeah. and David. Okay? We're also going to hear about energy, because that's the name of our show. <laughs> we'll be right energy. back. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's 
Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on ThinkTech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo. Bingo, we have returned, Mitch Ewan and David I, and we're talking about innovation at UH in the system large. Okay, Mitch, you were asking about incentives. Yeah, I was going to ask about incentives or the tools uh, you have uh, to be able to kind of change that corporate culture uh, of straight academia into more entrepreneurial. And I just want to use one example. It's like the current, my understanding is, or the current structure we have is you know, the academic side are really incentivized to produce uh, peer-reviewed papers like right away because their uh, tenure, their, their promotion structure through the university depends on the number of papers they write. And so the first reaction they have is, God, I've got this really great idea. I'm going to write a paper on it and get it out there. But of course, as soon as they get it out there, it's public domain and the university loses an opportunity. So how are we going to address that going forward? I think uh, there are two different things uh, we'd like to address. One is by training and awareness. So we're going out there meeting with um, the most active uh, innovators and inventors. Mm -hmm. We're also getting hooked into our own HR system. So when new faculty members are hired, we'll get a chance to provide this kind of initial training. So they understand what kind of a novelty requirement <laughs> will be baked into the uh, right. patent application process. So they're not supposed to make any public disclosure uh, until they, we, can, we get a chance to put together a good patent application. But there's also a second part. Uh, that is, our, our office must be solid enough that and we cannot obstruct an academic person's free academic publication. Right. They really hate it when they hear the words, oh, you're, we're sorry, you cannot publish that paper yet. Our patent application is not ready. Right. So in the ideal situation, if we get an advance warning that something is coming up uh, or they're about to publish a paper, about to give a conference speech, um, there should be at least a several weeks' time, uh, long enough for us to put together the patent application. Because right. you don't want to uh, get a situation where there is an inherent conflict and then you put the researcher in a difficult spot, they have to choose. Either they give this conference talk or they go for a patent application. And that is really unfair. Um, but what if you give them mm -hmm. points or credits mm -hmm. towards their promotion and advancement through uh, their profession for coming up with patents so that mm -hmm. they have an equal um, <coughs> incentive to say, oh, hold it, I can get, uh, you know, an equal amount of credit if I mm. hold this for the patent side of it. Um, mm. Of course, the patents have to be, like, legitimate patents and not just fluff mm. to, like, build up my portfolio, which is what the, you know, the patent office or the uh, OTT could, like, vet them and say, well, mm. we're not interested in this, so carry on. Mm. So have we, have we done that yet? It's, uh, it hasn't been done at UH. and it Does has it count for, uh, um, for tenure, tenure yeah, position, yeah, yeah. decision? Uh, it also hasn't done for the vast majority of universities. Um, I, I know that uh, some universities are putting in experiments, especially some in China, as a matter right. of fact. Um, but it, it, it can be controversial. Uh, for example, there are inherently certain fields of study where patents are just impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so true. if you're in the literature, in music, um, you know, there's just no patents available. Right. 
And then how, how could you, then working on the technology, you have this unfair advantage in well, terms why of is paper that, count. But why is that unfair? Well, I mean, in terms of paper count, you, you get to produce more results within yeah. a year. Mm -hmm. But I will also uh, point out that even within the same department, for instance, physics, mm -hmm. um, if someone is working on theoretical physics, so you discover some great you know, uh, gravity, uh, I'm sorry, gravity cannot be patented because that belongs to a force of nature. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not patentable. So yeah. Newton will be, will be robbed of his right. <laughs> potential patent count. Yeah. But here's a, another colleague working on some very practical instrumentation for the semiconductor industry, yeah. and you can crank out patents you know, very, very uh, productively. Right. So two faculty members in the same department will, will have to deal with this kind of an outcome. So it, it can be a little bit complicated, and perhaps we could actually think of a slightly modified system sure. uh, so that, for instance, when everything else being equal, you know, whether or not a faculty member has contributed positively to the commercialization, or shall we say dissemination, mm -hmm. um, uh, or application of his or her research right. you know, by all kinds of mechanisms. Uh, for instance, if it's political science professor, if that professor is actively guiding the government and making a lot of p p policy decisions, that is a very good use of your knowledge and your expertise to benefit the society. But that's not patentable. That's not patentable. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to describe a system that's perhaps flexible enough to take into account sure. that there are so many different uh, uh, diversity uh, I certainly agree that yeah. um, you can, you know, different departments have a different oh. likelihood of, of uh, entrepreneurial activity, of commercialization, of patents. But I wonder if we could go through them. I mean, what comes to mind, uh, mm -hmm. and this is not an order of importance, but SITAR, they have stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, engineering, for yep. sure. Yeah. Computer science, yeah. uh, maybe it's not a patent, or maybe it's oh, a uh, copyright, but something. Um, hmm. Chemistry. Energy, HNEI. Yep. Um, marine biology. Marine biology, sure. a lot of stuff a there. Lot. Uh, so, so that you can figure out which right. ones are the likely candidates. Right. But you know, there's something that's skewed here, and, and mm. that is that, suppose I'm, and I remember this actual device, there was this harbor robot about mm. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and the robot would go through the harbor and it, mm. would, it would be able to tell if there was something awry in the water. Yeah, sure. um, it would, it would, that was uh, the Sovum project. Yes, right. right. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was being funded by some mainland company. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how this works, but I'm really curious. So they know, Margo, uh, Margo mm -hmm. Wood, 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 what's her name? Margo? Edwards. Edwards mm -hmm. was working on it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and if mainland companies funding it, giving grants, what have you, in anticipation of getting involved on an economic basis. Um, now they, they have an investment in this. Mm -hmm. um, do they have a piece of the action? Do they negotiate for a piece of they the do, action? They need to uh, typically negotiate uh, a piece of the action, in your words, uh, in advance. At the time of the funding, uh, there will be assigning a Sponsor Research Agreement, SRA, uh, which will spell out the potential intellectual property and the disposition, how do you really deal with it? Typically, uh, if, it's a, uh, if the funding is significant enough, so it's not just like you know, you know, spending money, pocket change, um, they typically could be granted a, a non-exclusive right to use the technology. But for exclusive right, it's more complicated. It's going to go through your office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, so you, all, so all you these will things. supervise right. this, this agreement, right. and you will say whether it's fair or not right. fair, exactly. whether it's, it's too much uh, or too little. And, and this yeah. takes me to the question I was, mm. I was uh, waiting to ask you. You work. Woo! Mm. You work. Uh, yeah. What is it? Affiliated university research something? Mm. And it's, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's uh, classified. Mm -hmm. It's for the government, yeah. and it's dual use, right? Yeah. How does that work? Can you talk about it? Sure. Um, many universities conduct uh, research activities in areas that could be considered dual use, have, have that kind of potential. That means even though 
It could be earmarked for military use or earmarked for civilian use, but it also could be applied to the other side. And uh, such dual-use technologies would need to be treated carefully um, because, uh, first of all, um, in terms of any kind of export control, you need to be very, very careful. Um, otherwise, oh, right. there are statutes and yeah, regulations. Yeah, absolutely, and absolutely. Professors have gone to jail. Um, did you say jail? I jail. You said jail. jail. You said jail. Yeah, 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 he did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, so uh, that's why every research university has a export control officer um, uh, on the staff. We do as well. And uh, the other thing is that um, even with that kind of a situation, uh, there's a big distinction between what's considered basic research and applied research. Usually the applied research is where you might actually convert the technology into a physical device that could you know, uh, do some damage on the battlefield. Uh, but then if you're working on merely uh, uh, the basic research, uh, people usually encourage you to publish. And um, by the way, the publication uh, actually includes publication of the patent application. Uh, which is almost automatic after 18 months mm -hmm. of your original patent application date, the patent will get published. Once it is published in any kind of form, uh, that particular research is considered a basic research and therefore uh, will be carved out from export control. Uh, so now it's basically any researcher in the field could read about it and could try to improve upon it or could try to work around it uh, so, and that's how we advance technology. Well, yeah, it's all collaboration with other scientists elsewhere. Yep. And that's, that's got to be a central issue for you to make sure that, uh, that these scientists, these researchers are free to yep. do what they naturally do, which is A, have breakfast, <laughs> <laughs> and B, collaborate with everybody in the field all around the right. world. And you've got to let them you know, let, to do their thing about right. that. But at the same time, you have to control it from the from the export point of view and also yeah. from the university point of view. It's, it's a hard job, I think. Well, yeah. it's, a, it's a fun job, um, herding cats. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. And, and also allowing uh, researchers to feel that they, they, have, they can enjoy the full academic freedom um, you know, without too much encumbrances, but at the same time working very hard to make the system work. Uh, work for them. And I also want to come back to a, a question that Mitch uh, asked, how do we change a culture? So the culture is, uh, there are several different ways. Uh, one thing certainly is the awareness, uh, mm -hmm. teaching them how this whole process works. And the other thing is on how to figure out uh, the several viable models, if you will. Yeah. Uh, at Stanford and at other leading universities, one thing that's very clear to uh, most observers is that the most prolific inventors um, and the best uh, inventors that really impact the society are not the ones that leave the university job to become CEOs. They're the ones who re remain as major researcher on campus. Sure. But they encourage their postdoc students, PhD students, um, or other you know, outside uh, industry players to take their technology that will work with them um, right. to really commercialize it and sure. understand the process is still very important. So they need to be at least uh, quite aware and uh, quite knowledgeable about this whole process of how do you create a startup, how do you do the stock um, you know, investment and yeah. uh, uh, all the VC fundraising, all exactly. the different rounds of financing and all of that stuff. But they don't have to roll up the sleeve and become the CEO because exactly. they can be really, really good researchers. And you don't want to lose them. Oh, they're the and cutting they're, edge. And at the same time, they may not be the best CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they're not. <laughs> so um, yeah. in, a, in, a, in the best world scenario, we could actually have the cake and eat it too. Exactly. By reproducing the cake, acting someone else. <laughs> so that brings me up to Act 38, yeah. which we talked about just before the show. Could you talk about Act 38 and how that's sure. changing the uh, ecosystem yeah. here and for innovation? The original, uh, act, the original situation before Act 38 and 39 of last year was that the university was not allowed to engage in commercial activities. But Act 38 and 39 gave the university explicit power to engage in certain commercialization activity if they are related to 
commercializing university inventions. Right. So, uh, for, for example, we're able to actually um, uh, partner with a couple of other entities to create this aquaculture accelerator at Nauha. Right, the hatch, the, uh, the, hatch side, the hatch program, yeah. which is a great example. We were able to attract an outside, very experienced management team right. from Norway, from Ireland, and they have operations in Singapore, in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and they're trying to attract the world's best aquaculture technology companies. That's great. To come to Hawaii and then really help us build a vibrant community of right. aquaculture technology, and that really is uh, thanks to Act 38 and 39. That's great. You lobbied for that. Yeah. Sure. Nice job. We're about out of time. Oh, we are? Which, yeah. Oh, I had another I'm question. Sorry, you, yeah, well, you want to take, take 30 seconds. Okay, I just want to talk about Accelerate UH. What's uh, going on with that? I'm a graduate of Accelerate mm -hmm. UH. I'm a huge fan of it. It's a really great program. Mm -hmm. and I can, you know, what, what's, go, what's happening with it? Yeah, Accelerate UH has uh, been uh, quite successful over the last four years. And uh, now we are asking uh, PACE, which is a, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Business Entrepreneurship Center at Shiler College, to step up to become a uh, system-wide resource. So yeah. starting next year, 2020, uh, PACE will start running Accelerate UH program uh, inside PACE, but also benefiting the entire UH system. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, I mean, it's clear to me that we have to, we have to follow you and with you and, and uh, talk to you about some of the projects you're working on going forward. You're, you're at the heartbeat of our scientific future. Well, thank you. I think that's, that's an overstatement by far. We'll see no, about that. No, no, but, uh, not at all. We're, we're all trying to do the heavy lifting together all as right, a village. Okay, fair enough. So it's time for you to yeah. close. Summarize and well, close, Mitch. Well, what I just, you got? Yeah, okay. Well, I have the, the, the floor to close. Yeah. Is I'd like to see us use ThinkTech Hawaii uh, more effectively yeah. to highlight the technologies we're developing mm -hmm. at the university because... You know, they come in and give us their pitch, and then they get a YouTube uh, publication that goes uh, all over the world. And plus, you can use it in your outreach and uh, marketing for uh, licensing. Uh, oh, we love the idea. Yeah, yeah. That will be fantastic. So, thank you very much, and well, let's bring you back well, soon. Not, not, not a year. Thank you. Mitch. Maybe, uh, David. maybe thanks, quarterly, David. we'll have a breakfast <laughs> <Thank> here <you. laughs> yeah, and see what's going on. It's all so, breakfast. This is Think Tank. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We'd love you. to have you on the show, David. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.